Um, so good morning everyone and welcome to the second webinar of the Seamless Middle East series. Um, today we have a 60-minute panel discussion entitled Strengthening Your Digital Bank to Win New Customers and Retain Existing. Um, we're lucky to be joined by five industry experts on the panel today who have kindly agreed to share their insights as we discuss all things digital banking. Um, so joining us on the panel, we have Ellis Wang, who is the Chief Head of Technology Transformation and Information at Mashrek Bank. Mike Cunningham, who is the Chief Digital and Strategy Officer at Bank Saudi Franzi. Sonny Zulu, who is the Managing Director and Head of Retail Banking at Standard Chartered. Chitrajit Chakrabarti, who is the Head of JCC South Asia and the Indian Region for BPC. And moderating the session for us, we have Fraser Matthews, who is the Managing Director of Tribal Scale. So in a moment, I'd like to hand over to Fraser so that we can get started. Um, before I do that, can I ask all of our panelists to turn on their webcams and their microphones? And whilst everyone is doing that, um, I'd like to remind all webinar attendees that you can ask questions throughout the panel session um, and our panelists will do their best to answer them. Uh, so without further ado, Fraser, uh, over to you. Thank you very much and welcome everyone to today's Seamless Middle East webinar, uh, where we'll focus on discussions on strengthening our digital banking, how to win new customers in the new market conditions, how to retain our existing customers, and a focus on how technology can help to underpin and enable this. Uh, we'd also like to thank uh, BPC Banking Technologies for being the sponsoring partner for this session. Um, today, we will focus on how things have changed since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, much of the way in which we live our lives has changed. And while we are focused on staying home and on staying safe, uh, the fact of the matter is that financial services customers still require the same levels of services and support that they're used to having in, in our usual working environment. Uh, in this time of quarantine and isolation, we've seen a massive increase in e-commerce transactions, in offline cha uh, sales channels coming online, and in payments and transfer volumes. Uh, there's also a clear arms race underway uh, in the region around digital sales, e-commerce, and digital banking. And from a financial services perspective, we are now seeing a need for rationalization in current regulation to help us enable digital technologies to lead us through this crisis. But the particular focus on reductions in cash, particularly with services and industries which rely on it, our onboarding and offboarding procedures, our applications for, pro uh, for processes, and as well, bringing the bank truly online. As part of this discussion, our panelists today, uh, Mike, Ellis, Sunny, and Chit Rajit, um, I'll allow you to do a quick introduction. We can start with Mike. Thanks, Fraser. Pleasure to be here today. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so Mike Cunningham, um, Chief Strategy and Digital Officer for Bank Saudi Francie. Um, I look after digital. I look after the, uh, the bank's uh, overall strategy, uh, change function, um, our customer experience teams and our marketing and corporate comms teams within the bank. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Alice? Hi, good, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Alice. Uh, I come from the Marshall Bank. Uh, I just joined the Marshall Bank for two months. Uh, my more focus on the uh, information, digital transformation, and the knowledge to help the uh, bank can be uh, ready to uh, digitalize uh, and uh, use the cloud technology to help to have a more customer experience to provide more service. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Sunny? Great. So my name is uh, Sunny uh, Zulu. I'm the MD uh, for retail banking at uh, Standard Chartered. Um, looked at uh, transformation, uh, strategic alliances, and performance management for Africa and the Middle uh, East. Uh, been in uh, banking for over 16 years now. And in retail banking, I look after um, personal uh, clients, uh, priority clients, uh, covering wealth management and all the products that uh, we have for our retail customers. Great, thank you. Chip Rashid? 
Hi, uh, very good morning to all of you. Uh, I am Chitrajit. Uh, I take care of uh, Middle East, especially GCC market, uh, South Asia, uh, including India. So I manage business for BPC, which um, uh, BPC has uh, is in the market for the last uh, 25 odd years. And uh, we uh, support our clients from acquiring an insurance perspective and uh, offering innovative technology in the market. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, so the framework for this conversation that we're going to have today uh, will be broken up into three different parts. Uh, the first is that we're going to have some questions in which we'll go around to each of the panelists and have our, our typical panel discussion that you'd be used to if you came to any seamless conference. Uh, the second is we'll have some panelist specific questions. We're going to drill into some of the initiatives that each of these gentlemen are undertaking in their financial institutions. And as well, we will welcome questions from our audience. So there is a side panel where questions can be added. Uh, Julia from the Seamless team will be curating those and bringing those up to us. So feel free to get involved on the side panel for all of our attendees. Um, our first topic is around uh, digital transformation strategy. Uh, we'll start with you, Alice. Uh, how important is the acceleration and the rollout of your bank's digital transformation strategy in order to support the surge in digital banking customers? Yeah, I think that is the important question for each of the parents because uh, COVID is a virus, uh, COVID-19, right? So all the customers use the uh, digital device as a service. So how you to make sure the customer can have their seamless experience use mobile phone or the PC, still can do in the ask the service just like a PAU, business as usually. So how you to make sure is the efficiency also uh, to provide the uh, security without any the uh, damage for the BAU. I think that is very, very important, especially for each of the bank. Fantastic. And Sunny, uh, from your perspective with Standard Chartered, um, how much are, are you putting into acceleration around digital transformation within the bank, both uh, here in the region and also within the African region? Great. So I think there's a lot that is going on, and I must say that um, you know the current uh, crisis uh, for us, um, you know, came at a time when there was a lot that uh, we were already doing, uh, focusing on uh, digital. Uh, you might be aware that uh, we launched our first, um, you know, uh, digital bank uh, in Africa, and then within a short period of time, we rolled it out in uh, over eight um, markets. And uh, we had all our clients uh, being aligned, our um, front line uh, being aligned as well. Uh, I must say that um, with the current crisis, though, we have seen an acceleration in terms of um, adoption because um, every time you're doing digital migration, there is always a certain percentage of clients that uh, come in a little bit uh, late that you have to um, you know, to influence and to be able to show the benefits. But uh, during this time, we have been seeing those clients coming in proactively, reaching out to the bank and saying, how can I use uh, this uh, platform? Uh, how can I make this transaction digitally? So over this uh, period, we have seen a massive uh, acceleration and uptake on uh, digital transactions. Fantastic. And Mike, um, from Bank Saudi Francie perspective, um, and particularly in Saudi Arabia. How important is it to the bank to accelerate your digital transformation strategy? And how much effort are you putting in towards rolling this out as quickly as possible? Yes, yeah, so it's um, it's right at the center of everything that we're doing and have, have been doing for the last 12 months. So I wouldn't say that, that COVID-19 has, has kind of changed our momentum at all. Um, we are running a, a, a two-phased kind of approach uh, both in parallel, um, running slightly at different speeds. Uh, one is continuing to kind of develop our legacy businesses, um, the ones that are the cash cows that are making us a lot of money, We're going through a core banking replatform at the moment, which as we all know is no small undertaking, um, but continue uh, to invest heavily within that side of the business. And then we've got kind of the digital ventures area which is more like a skunk works which is where we look at kind of new business models and how we can exploit technology digital technology to create new opportunities 
and it's where we do a lot of our experimentation, but with a very, very kind of clear direction that it's not a place to play, but it's a place to build things that will add greater value to kind of BSF 2.0. And at some point, I've got to pay back. Fantastic. And Chip Rajit, uh, within BPC, what are some of the products and services that you're bringing into the market to support banks as they are rolling out large-scale transformation programs, not only in the past year, uh, but also looking forward uh, based on some of the changes in the ecosystem that we're seeing this year? Yeah, very uh, relevant and pertinent question. So first thing, I uh, would like to highlight one particular point, and this is, uh, this is uh, what BPC BPC believes over uh, over the last uh, 20 odd years, uh, we uh, invest 23% of our revenue into research and development, and that is a very important point wherein uh, we bring up new uh, products and services which are very relevant to present scenario or uh, any kind of uh, to face any kind of challenges. And uh, presently, uh, uh, so one is conventional business for BPC, but I believe uh, we have developed certain products and services uh, which have really um, uh, created some buzz in the market. Uh, if uh, Mr. Zulu must be knowing, there is a bank called the Time Bank in um, South Africa. And uh, we deployed uh, a standalone digital uh, platform, digital banking platform in Time Bank. Uh, that happened in uh, February uh, 2019. Just to give you some certain numbers, uh, BPC deployed uh, the solution there in 2019. Uh, that time, the client base was 80,000. And right now, we are sitting on uh, 2020. And the client base is 6 million. And that is the kind of uh, scalability BPC can offer. Well, so I would uh, like to discuss on this uh, uh, later on uh, during this discussion. But another uh, very big achievement from BPC in terms of offering uh, financial inclusion uh, services to various clients uh, across the globe is a marketplace solution, which we developed and deployed, and that's created a separate business line for um, BPC uh, in, in India. We started in India, and we want to uh, roll it in other uh, continents. And uh, so these are the two uh, products uh, which, uh, other than that, we have conventional digital banking product, which is getting innovated as we, as we progress forward. So we are completely committed uh, for our clients to offer innovative solutions and services uh, to move forward and cater the market as per the needs and uh, regulation guidelines. That's great. Thank you. Um, one of the key areas uh, with, the, with the pandemic right now is that uh, customers need to be able to self-serve. Um, they need to be able to uh, help that they need, make the transactions that they need to do, onboard, offboard, etc. And one of the really important responsibilities of the financial institutions right now is around customer education. Uh, how are some of your banks responding to the crisis to educate your customers around what services are available, uh, how to use them, how to avail your services, and how to educate them about the best ways to use your bank? Uh, we've seen a lot of marketing campaigns focused around this, but in particular, I'd like to know how you're educating your customers, how you're allowing them to work with you and feel a bit like a partner with you and part of your family as we go through this crisis. I'd like to start with you, Sonny. Uh, what are some of the ways that SCB is, is reaching out to customers and letting them know how to perform their digital banking services themselves? Great. Uh, thank you very much, Fraser. So there are a lot of things that we are doing. Uh, first of all, uh, we started by you know, reaching out to our own clients because our clients, we've got all their contact details. Uh, we are able to reach them through uh, emails. And uh, one thing that was very critical for us is to be able to quickly get to our clients, uh, provide them with alternative ways uh, for them to continue doing their banking from their homes and uh, from anywhere where they are. So we reached out uh, using um, you know, uh, emails and SMSs. Uh, we also gone further to starting uh, doing uh, webinars uh, with our um, clients and uh, on various things about not only on the payments, but also on uh, what are some of the opportunities that are there at this um, you know, time, uh, whether it is uh, from an investment um, uh, perspective or protection and all across all the different um, uh, products. 
uh, apart from our own clients, uh, we think that, that we have a responsibility to also be able to educate. And, uh, you know, like I'm, I'm participating in this uh, webinar, I have many other uh, senior colleagues also going out there, speaking to uh, communities uh, on various uh, topics. For example, we have the relief program that the central bank uh, has announced, and uh, not so many clients know about, um, you know, that um, relief program and how they can qualify and what it means. And uh, we are taking that time to explain those regulatory uh, you know initiatives and changes that are there in the market so very very active at the moment and uh, we are delighted with the response that we are getting from clients which has been very very positive oh, that's great to hear uh, Mike what are some of the ways in which BSF has been connecting with customers and educating customers through your digital channels yeah so I think um uh, and it'll probably be no surprise if if you had ten bankers, we'd all pretty much say the same thing. Um, so I echo a lot of what uh, Sunny has said. Uh, we've probably gone maybe one step further, and I took this from um, from my Barclays days. At Barclays, we used to have these uh, these people that we call Barclays Digital Eagles, and they would sit in the branch. And when somebody walked into a branch that tried to do a transaction, if you were able to do that online. They would sit with the customer and help show them this is how you can do this via your mobile or your online channel um, to give them that education there and then to then prevent them from having to return uh, to the branch as part of that. Um, we've also been extremely proactive in making sure that customers also understand all of the stimulus packages that the regulators and the government have put on offer and that we're offering in terms of holiday payments, et cetera, and how to avail them. So uh, very, very aligned with, uh, with what the good guys at SC are doing as well. Ellis, what are some of the ways that uh, mashrack has been reaching out to the customer base and, and educating them and, and helping them to understand the services that you guys provide there at Mashrack? Yeah, I think Ellis, it's the uh, uh, very important, important the, uh, a staff or to how to engage with the customer when we move to the cloud, we move to the digital. So uh, for the Marshall Bank, actually we were engaged with the consumer through the media of their choice because uh, some customer will use the app, some customer will use the WhatsApp, some customer actually want to go to the ATM. So actually we were engaged the, all of the our customer through the uh, media and their choice. The second, we will use the data to make the decision to provide what kind of service we need to service our customer. So that's what that means that we use the data analytics. We use the uh, uh, customization, the uh, service to service the, uh, the customer. And then since the uh, uh, coronavirus, so most of the people will not go to the branch. They will may stay at home. So we need to have provide engage with the different marketplace to provide the more service to the customer. So how we to educate our customer? Actually, we use the uh, different way to serve the customer and use the data driven to provide their customization service. That's great. Thank you very much for that. Chip Rajit, um, obviously this is a great uh, forum that you've helped put on for us with BPC. Um, what are some of the other ways that BBC has been engaging with the market, with customers, with banking customers, and as well your customers around digital services and solutions uh, during this crisis? Well, uh, first thing, uh, you know, we never uh, uh, we never intended to see such kind of scenario, which is very unfortunate, which we are going uh, are coming across presently. But one thing uh, as a community uh, together we have achieved that we have been talking about uh, this cashless society uh, wherein uh, less uh, transactions would happen um, uh, with uh, physical connections. So uh, this thing, um, I believe we are getting to solve this problem as we move forward. And uh, from BPC's point of view, uh, we are uh, we have seen and we have seen this progress coming up. So that's the reason uh, certain products and services we launched in the last uh, year, and uh, it's going on this year as well. One of them, as I mentioned, the uh, standalone digital platform uh, or digital.
Well, he's frozen there for the moment. So um, what we'll do is we can... back from for various banks. There are banks who are envisaging to offer uh, a... Uh, can't you hear? Can you hear me now? No? Sorry? Yes, we can. Can you hear me now? Okay, sorry. Uh, apologies from my side, certain issues. So uh, certain banks, uh, uh, I was mentioning, certain banks uh, who are um, offering standalone digital platform and uh, present scenario, like Time Bank, or uh, the banks who are uh, creating a, a separate platform for themselves, which is completely branchless. So if I take an example, and time and again, I'm taking this example of Time Bank because we have seen significant uh, improvement uh, in terms of client interaction. So uh, it is absolutely branchless uh, banking platform uh, and uh, completely operated to kiosk. They have uh, integrated their solutions and uh, tied up with the uh, grocery chain, uh, which is uh, pick and pay. And uh, through this, uh, they have offered uh, the platform across the, uh, across the country. So significant jump in the customer base is there. Another very important product uh, for us is marketplace wherein uh, a, a wholesaler and the retailer can in, uh, discuss and uh, interact uh, and uh, they can see the inventories and accordingly they can purchase. Uh, so it's absolutely a contactless kind of payment platform which can be front-ended with a, a digital wallet or mobile wallet platform. This is very, very successful business line uh, for BPC in India. We started this product uh, in the last year, uh, December, uh, as a name of Safal Fasal. Um, so that is uh, that is already being launched and successfully being delivered. Uh, third, very important part of wherein banks are pay, uh, paying much attention is uh, in the transport industry, which is which, which can create a niche uh, for the clients like, uh, vendors like us. So that is uh, automatic fare collection. Uh, we have a, a robust automatic fare collection platform, which is uh, wherein uh, various banks are presently working with. Uh, 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 local transport companies, government uh, authorities to offer a uh, seamless um, uh, experience to the clients. And this is an open loop platform wherein uh, customers, uh, flex customers are given flexibility. They can uh, use any of the payment uh, instruments to purchase tickets and uh, do the transactions. So from that perspective, uh, BPC is, I believe, one step ahead uh, of time, and they offer solutions which are very, very um, pertinent to present scenario. So we are still innovating. We are learning every every day and try to offer and cater the market uh, to the best of our potentials. Oh, fantastic. Well, I think customer education has become increasingly uh, important, and I think we've even seen uh, some banks going down the routes of maybe non-traditional channels. Um, some banks are now on TikTok. We're seeing a lot of uh, banking information going out uh, you know, through Instagram, through Facebook, and banks are kind of penetrating into the channels, uh, which we might see as non-traditional, but it's where our customers are. Um, and as a bit of a segue from that, uh, I'd like to kind of get some, some focus questions from our panelists at this point in time. Uh, Mike, I'm going to start with you. Uh, in particular, I'd like to know what are some of the key actions that banks should be taking to win new customers? And also, how are you focusing on retaining your existing customers uh, during this time? Yeah, sure. So, um, apologies to people that know me. I've been probably banging this drum for the last decade. Um, I've said it many times before, but it, it's all about taking that kind of, that relentless pursuit of that of the best customer experience both on and offline, and also never being satisfied that the mission's complete. There's always friction still there. There's always ways to get better. And, you know, people just don't like banks. You know, we're not sexy in any way and, frankly, not very interesting. You know, yet people, you know, will come to us and they will involve us in the most important parts of their life. You know, like going and buying a home, planning for the future, new baby arrives, you know, how do we start to plan for that? And these times are what really happy times. And what do we do as bankers? We make it miserable. And we don't do it on purpose because I, I believe that 99.9% .9 of bankers are all extremely good people with high integrity. But unfortunately, we do it all by design. And that's, that's what we need to fix, right? You know, it's the design of that experience and when we get it right 
that's when you build truly sustainable businesses right i think it applies to everything not just banks but that's where you get sustainable businesses and it makes the customers they become less price sensitive because you know people are happy to pay a premium you know and they place that premium on quality and convenience they're going to buy more from you so it's easy as opposed to you know trying to shop around to get a, you know an interest rate here and there they tell their friends so they become your you know your acquisition engine and they stay longer because great experience equals loyalty and finally you know i, I think in addition you know to to you know that, that that relentless pursuit of great experience a regular and consistent kind of battery and assault of bite-sized innovations that you can talk about with your customers that you can engage with your customers not only will that keep you ahead of the competition but it also keeps you top of mind within the customer so you know if there's any kind of secret sauce and you know that is a very kind of macro but that is the philosophy that i kind of try and lead throughout uh, throughout our team that's fantastic i like the idea around the bite size innovations as well uh, and step changes in the market and, uh, also we've seen a lot of um you know, step changes in ashrec this year as well um i'd like to ask you how Mar how Mafric has positioned itself in the market during this period and, and how you find early adoption of technology uh, in particular in the UAE has helped create an edge for the bank? Yeah, sensible lot of question. Um, I, I think that the, uh, since I joined the uh, Australia Bank only two months, but I really surprised uh, we can have the 95% work from home from the first day lockdown. So I think that is amazing because uh, we only uh, provide the uh, ready to go, the infrastructure ready, uh, operations ready, and security is ready, and service are ready. So that's why we can have the 95% work from home from the first day. And uh, how we to position us? Because the uh, coronavirus, so we position us as the uh, move on the uh, the branch bank to the digital banking. So that means we uh, provide a 100% of service from the uh, app, from the PC, from the cloud. Now, because the, the situation, so we open the API to position like a, a open banking because we want to have the more the engagement with a different kind of a service to provide to our customer, for example, healthy care and life care and business care because the, for the bank we not just the provide a money service only because this is a situation we want to have a people and we also provide the uh, more the good uh, user experience to help our customer so that's why we position reposition us like uh, uh, open banking and that is to help us to have a more and more the engagement with the different service provider. And that means that we can service our customer with the more a good the user experience. Um, that is the goal for us to provide the um, in-branch and out-branch as soon as the customer service together. Um, based on that, we can uh, treat, uh, treat the Marshall Bank like a uh, platform. That is the uh, based on the uh, service providing, based on the customer driven, based on the cloud technology, we can have a more better service to our customer. That's great. Uh, Sonny, I'm going to come over to you for this question. And as one of the largest universal banks in the world, uh, you see all different types of customers from retail to corporate to institutional to investments. How is the bank? looking at technology enablement um, across the different lines of services in the bank, so not just retail. Um, how are we looking at incorporating digital into business banking, into investing? And how is the bank looking to scale out solutions to help uh, with those customer bases? Great. Uh, thanks, um, Fraser. Look, I think um, 
for, for us, we have been on this uh, journey, I think, uh, like many other banks, uh, for uh, quite uh, some time. And the intention has always been that, how do we get more clients to become digital? And uh, we have been seeing different responses. Uh, we have been seeing, you know, um, a certain segment of clients that have been proactive and they have been demanding and they've been coming and it has been very easy, you know, to, um, to onboard them and to provide the services. We've also had those that uh, have had uh, several concerns, others, uh, you know, cyber security and so on. They are digitally savvy on themselves, but when they look at certain transactions, um, you know, they would want to be convinced that it's safe for them to use those uh, platforms. And then we've had another segment of clients that, uh, you know, very uncomfortable uh, with uh, using any of the digital platforms. And that cuts across individuals and uh, businesses as well. Uh, what we have done, which I think is very important for everybody to do, is to ensure that uh, all the service requests, you have a journey that is available on the digital platform. Um, we, and, and that is uh, very, very critical. It's very possible. I'm sure that a lot of people might have experienced that. You can go for three, four, five years without ever going into a branch. And um, you still continue doing your banking, you still continue having all the services. But that, um, you know, uh, as service providers, we have to ensure that it's seamless, it's uh, very easy to use, it's uh, user friendly, and if a client uh, needs uh, help, they know where to go, and very quickly it will be given out to them. So one of the things that we have been doing is to ensure for every service journey, we have it on our digital platform without requiring the first to first. There's still a bit of work to do, uh, Fraser, because uh, in some cases, uh, very you know, uh, few cases, there are some regulations that uh, we have to deal with that uh, require that uh, there has to be a first-to-first -first meeting, there has to be a work signature, the client has to sign on every page, and, and so forth and so on. And those are things that um, you know we are engaging uh, with um, you know relevant regulators to ensure that um, uh, we enable all services without exception to be available for businesses and individuals on digital platforms. Oh, that's fantastic. And it's great to hear from that perspective as well. Uh, Chip Rajiv, what are some of the ways that solution providers are, are helping banks as they look to uh, not only sustain, but grow their client bases and, and, and go on the customer acquisition journey uh, during this crisis? Well, uh, very important part is uh, when uh, we are seeing the present scenario, uh, we, we uh, have this um, advantage wherein customers are very much well aware of the fact that uh, now they need to get rid of uh, conventional banking process or uh, the transaction process and they need to go um, into the cashless economy. So this is uh, this is a kind of awareness which we were uh, looking at for a long time. From our perspective, it is our duty as well um, as, as a service provider or solution provider that we offer a solution which is robust. At the same time, it has um, it, it has it manages the kind of um, fraudulent activities which are happening presently. So if you see the last uh, two months time period. Uh, we have come across around uh, 350,000 phishing uh, websites coming into picture. So this is uh, something which I want to draw attention um, uh, to the panelists and uh, everybody in the audience. That you know we are um, uh, having this kind of issues as we progress and as we do more online transactions. We see this uh, problem coming up and creeping up uh, every now and then. Uh, thankfully, uh, BPC offered um, a long back, we started with our card uh, fraud management system and we boost the solution uh, with uh, enterprise fraud management system as well, which is successfully being deployed and being used by one of the biggest banks in the Middle East presently. So uh, this is very important point that uh, when uh, we are talking about uh, uh, commoners' money, uh, uh, people who trust the banks and they go for uh, the various transactions, they put money into their account, we need to offer them the comfort zone that your money is safe and secure. And from that point of view, every transaction is important because if you lose a, sm a small transaction, if you lose a small penny, 
that will harm your reputation uh, significantly in the market. So BPC is uh, well committed towards that to offer a broader our products and services along with the fraud, fraud management system, which can cater uh, and which can nullify these threats, which are uh, uh, every now and then uh, creating issues uh, in the market. So this is this is one of the parts which I would like to highlight that um, the fraud management system is the key here. Along with that, as I mentioned that, uh, to you earlier, we, uh, we offer our solutions through a processing platform. Uh, so there are uh, countries wherein uh, the rules and regulations, uh, rules and regulations are not that stringent from central bank. In such scenario, customers can be benefited. I mean, uh, banks and financial institutions can be benefited by uh, offering the solution through our processing center. In such scenario, they can uh, uh, they do not need to uh, invest towards the hardware, and we can process that transaction. It is not important that all, all the countries can uh, do that because of the central bank regulations. But there are opportunities wherein we can process the transaction on behalf of the banks, and we can offer complete managed services. So we are uh, trying to offer complete flexibility to our community to the banks to the fraternities so that we can um, ultimately achieve the common goal uh, which is to cater the end client successfully thank you for that um one of the key points that we've been discussing here is, is moving customers onto channels and in effect moving them away from branches it's something that we all been struggling with from an identity perspective for the past decade on is the branch relevant? Is it needed? What do we need it for? Um, at this point in time, through our customer education, we're telling customers about services and capabilities that maybe they didn't know about before, while at the same time um, kind of achieving some of our targets and goals around moving customers away from the branches. Uh, Mike, I just wanted to ask to of you, how can we start to wean customers away from the legacy? And those like branches, how do we start to move them onto new platforms? And, and what are some of the ways that not only can you um, encourage it for customers, but also enable it for them to make them feel comfortable with it? Sure. Um, listen, Fraser, can I just start with an apology? I've just realized that I've been sat here drinking my morning cup of tea um, in the UK. I'm so sorry. I, you know, we're in the middle of Ramadan and I hope I haven't offended anybody. I had a complete senior moment, so uh, so apologies to anybody that, that that's kind of watching. It's uh, it wasn't intentional uh, whatsoever, um, so please forgive me. Um, in terms of the question you asked, uh, so I fully fully expect branches to become a thing of the past, and honestly, I hope they do. Um, I believe that the the only reason why we need them and customers still use them is because. You know our our legacy operating models offer no alternatives. You know in 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 this region, other than kind of you know maybe for some advice, I don't believe that anybody wants to try and find parking on a July day at lunchtime in Riyadh or Dubai um, to go to a branch. And you know we need to change that. And you know we need to change that. We need to reimagine you know customer journeys. We need to work with our regulators to, to try and facilitate, you know, greater kind of uh, online services. Um, my regulator in Riyadh, uh, Sama, has been great at this and uh, recently allowed banks in the kingdom to do full online personal loans from application all the way through to disbursement, which is a huge step forward. Uh, for us, it, it started with credit cards and a very pilot, but because of COVID-19, they said right do it for personal loans as well, which was just exceptional. Um, the fly in the ointment is that it only applies if the customer has already been to a branch to open their account. So, in other words, you can't have a customer open an account digitally online and also then avail a personal loan digitally. At some point, they will have had to have gone to the branch to do KYC, it's one or, or the other. And I understand why, et cetera, but we need to find ways to, to fix that, to solve for that, to make it safe and you know ways to make that happen. Um, and again, you know, we'll continue to, to engage with the regulator and, and work with them around that. That said, Honestly, until we find ways to 
migrate more services out of the branch, you've got to continue to invest in the branch because our customers deserve a certain level of experience and they should get just as good experience in branch as they should online. Um, so, you know, th there's no one or the other. You can't just kind of go, let's go mobile first. Let's put all of our investment there. You've got to do the investment on, on both sides at the moment. Right. Thank you, Mike. Sonny, you have um, what might be an enviable position in that Standard Chartered Bank historically uh, had a cap on the number of branches in the region. Uh, so over in that channel perhaps wasn't something that was a strain for you. But I wanted to get from your perspective as one of the largest banks in the world, um, what are some of the ways that you're reimagining branch services? And how have you made any changes to those branch services now COVID crisis, uh, to enable online platforms to take on transaction? And lastly, what are some of the ways that um, you believe that we can work with regulators around uh, making changes based on what we've learned during this period? Great. Uh, thank you so much. So we have gone through, you know, a uh, massive transformation journey over the last uh, few uh, years. Uh, and um, yeah, as it was highlighted earlier, you know, the branch discussion has always been there for as long as I remember. We need branches and we need branches. We need branches in future or not and so on. Uh, for us at Standard Chartered, uh, I think uh, we have been through that journey. Uh, we are at a point now where we are very, very uh, clear that um, you know, a lot of our clients uh, today can be served uh, digitally and we'll keep a few branches that um, will uh, remain because um, you know, we, we cannot just have one model uh, completely. Uh, one of the things that uh, we have um, done is um, we have engaged with regulators in a number of markets and uh, we have seen regulators actually becoming even more and more progressive and uh, they have been um, welcoming ideas of uh, supporting a complete digital transformation. In some of the markets, what we have seen is regulators have allowed up to a certain threshold, up to a certain limit to be able to open, you know, a light KYC accounts. And these you can be able to open without having a first-to-first, uh, without, um, you know, meeting the clients. One of the, the beauty about technology today is that uh, there are a lot of, um, you know, uh, technologies that can actually help to verify a client even far better than a first-to-first. So with uh, all these, um, you know, chips that we have on uh, IDs, uh, you can be able to ping the, um, you know, the, the, the national database uh, to confirm it's um, the right ID. You are able also to use, uh, you know, different technologies to confirm that the face that uh, is, uh, you know, taking that picture, it's a live picture. It is uh, indeed the same as the one that is on the ID. And uh, within a few minutes, you can be, or seconds actually, you can be able to confirm that this is indeed Fraser Matthews that I'm talking to and not an imposter. And that is available today. So in some of the markets, we have already started uh, doing complete digital onboarding without having any first-to-first. -first. Um, if I speak about the UAE as an example, we have uh, launched our digital credit card where the client can be able to apply for a credit card right from the comfort of their home and it is approved in within five to 10 minutes and a digital card issued and the client can be able to use it right there and then. And um, so I think there's a lot that um, you know, has been uh, happening. Uh, we have been reducing on the number of uh, branches on a needs basis. I think for us, it's not really should we have a branch or not. I think we are looking at the client behaviors and uh, we are looking at um, you know, how can we be able to reach clients in this geography and um, if it is um, you know, relevant to keep a branch there, we will. If it is not, uh, we will not keep it just for the sake of uh, having brick and mortar. We'll be able to, to find alternatives. I love that. Thank you very much for that, sound, Sunny. Um, Ellis, from your perspective, from Ashraf perspective, um, I have two questions for you. One around the future of retail banking being potentially branchless, or if you think that banks will continue to invest in brick and mortar. And the second question I had for you is, do you think that there's an appetite to have different branches for different customer types, you know, splitting up between retail and business banking as an example? 
Yeah, I think that is a really good question. So more, right now, the consumer actually looking for the customized service. So um, they actually can use a mobile app to get the very basic the service, but sometimes they will go to branch to get their private service. So branch, we still wear investment, but very de depend on the customer segmentation. Uh, for example, for the corporate banking, uh, we have to more the consulting service to the uh, nearby the, the corporate. So for that, we will have build up the branch to service that. But for most of the consumer, because the, they will want to get the uh, service from their mobile app. So how we can provide more and more the cloud service to the app from the internet to service a retail customer. I think that is very important too. But just the, uh, agree with the mic, uh, since the KYC is a very important you know, technology to keep the uh, bank can have the digital insight because after you have the KYC, then you can start to service the customer, right? So uh, like a, a mature bank, we uh, stopped the KYC on blockchain to work with the DIFC to provide how we can onboard the customer based on the blockchain technology. That means we also, we not just provide the uh, efficiency, easy to use, we also really care about the uh, security. So based on blockchain technology, we can share the customer, the profile to different the partner, even like uh, other bank, even other the uh, service provider, because that means everybody based on the security platform to have the more engaged the service to the customer. So when we talk about the branch, the uh, importance, we more uh, in face on the, uh, we start on the digital uh, in first because we need to get the customer data 100% secure, then we can have the internal process to service the customer. So we start on the digital in. After we have the data, then we can continue praying for the digital out that means based on the KYC, based on the blockchain, we engage with different services through the internet, through the branch face-to-face -face service. We can based on the customer the life cycle to design different kind of service to service them. So KYC on blockchain is the first to have the digital in process automation in a bank. Then we plan for the customer life cycle for the digital out service, then to engage with the different marketplace. That is a merchant bank strategy for that. That's great. Thank you so much for that. Um, just as we're getting towards the end of the time period here, um, firstly, I'll, I've got a quick question I wanted to ask uh, Chit Rajit, and then we'll move on to some of our audience questions. So. Um, we've got 120 people attending today, uh, which we really appreciate. And if any of you have questions, now's the time to put them in. Uh, so we can get to a bit of a lightning round with the panelists towards the end here. But uh, Chit Rajit, um, do you think that banks are going to face challenges from a fintech perspective, as the you know, the kind of needs of the hours and the need to customers that you know we're seeing a lot of reactionary uh, work in the market um, from banks? Do you think that some of the new solutions and models are going to start to uh, challenge bank capabilities and provide a challenge? Yeah, uh, definitely, definitely. Uh, banks would uh, find certain challenges uh, to cope with uh, the ever-changing um, scenario in payment industry, but this challenge uh, we all should embrace uh, along with the bank because we are a part of this banking fraternity as well. We consider ourselves as partners of our clients and various banks. So this is a this is a good challenge to have in front of us. So that is one part. The, not the challenges. Uh, one of the biggest challenges would be adaptability. And whenever we are saying that uh, this is a challenge for a bank, but this is a challenge for the regulators as well to offer flexibility to the bank so that they can uh, offer the kind of uh, products and uh, services to the end clients. And from that perspective, we uh, play a significant role uh, in terms of customer acquisition which is very important into the scenario that, you know, new customers are coming on board, whether financial inclusion is taking place, whether help, we are helping BPC as BPC, we are helping the banks to offer financial inclusion 
Uh, biggest example uh, would be Tonic Bank in Philippines. Seventy percent of the clients they are uh, not they are not using any banking facilities, and we are offering solutions there. Um, so that is one of the biggest use cases for us. Uh, other than that, uh, sustaining with the present scenario, uh, you know, we need to adapt and grow uh, together. And uh, from that perspective, uh, the strong uh, fraud management system in place and the constant uh, innovation in terms of uh, bringing new solutions, new technologies in place, and uh, just understand what your customer requires, what your customer demands, and accordingly change yourself. That is most important uh, in present scenario. So three challenges I can see here. One is adaptability, which is a big challenge. Actually, we all uh, say that you know we want to change, we want to uh, make sure that our customers are happy. End of the day, uh, probably 20 or 30 percent banks who can offer the solutions, which are really customer friendly. Uh, second point is new customer acquisition that is important from service point of view. And third is uh, continuing with the customer base that the banks have. And we as a payment solution provider, we have a big duty and big role to play uh, alongside the banks to grow the grow their customer base. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll start off with our first audience question, so um, we'll pop around the room. I'll just name you off one by one uh, so that everyone gets a, a chance at this. So this is from um, Jerome Van Dyke. Uh, what would one piece of advice be to traditional banks to help get their act together in the digital era? And what is one piece of advice to challenger banks to learn from traditional banks at this point in time? Mike, you've been on both sides of this, um, so I think we could start with you. Um, a piece of advice for traditional banks to learn from challengers and a piece of advice to challengers to learn from traditional banks. Okay, um, so for traditional banks, it would be to get from A to B, you probably need to start from a different place and stop trying to build on the same legacy infrastructure that you've got. You know, it's one of the biggest handbrakes that any of the banks have is that infrastructure that they've designed for a previous time, etc. Uh, so I think you know, kind of you know, focusing on new tech stack and you know, kind of you know, the, you know, focus around that customer journey is probably the you know the big piece um, for the for the challenger banks. That's a real kind of tough one because you know when I look at this at the success and of, of Monzo and the guys there are my friends. I'm. Uh, I'm not convinced that they're doing anything wrong. Um, if only they had as much capital as us big fat cats, you know, they'd be profitable, they'd be lending and that type of thing. Um, so genuinely, I think that, that there's more for, for, for us uh, traditional banks to learn um, from, from the new guys than there is the other way around. Alice, over to you. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I think the one thing that's more challenging for a traditional bank is the position change. For example, uh, in the past hundreds of years, uh, people go to the bank to save the money, deposit the money to control uh, management that. But as now, more people care about the service. So the payment just the last mile. So that is, means the bank position is changed from the first the front end line to the second line. So how we can provide more the, the, the money service engage with the people and the sub marketplace. I think that is very challenging for the traditional bank. So that's why the Marshall Bank move from the digital banking to open banking to platform banking, because we need to service more and more the new customers based on different requirements. So that is the challenge. Is someone about to take off? <laughs> what's, what's one thing that uh, traditional banks can learn from uh, the challengers, and what's one thing that the challengers can learn from the traditional banks from your perspective? Great, that was for me, right? Okay, good. Fantastic. Yeah, so I think one piece of advice, uh, I think for me, for traditional banks is um, 
do not lose the mindset that has been adopted uh, during this um, crisis. Um, you know, traditionally and in the past, we have seen that most traditional banks um, would take a bit um, longer, relatively longer, to get uh, projects approved, to get uh, initiatives out, because you know there's quite a lot of uh, bureaucracy that one has to go through to get um, you know things just uh, out there. Uh, and some of it, to be honest, uh, it is also, you know, uh, it was being challenged by um, uh, regulations and, and so on. Uh, what we have seen during this time, it's um, an impressive, you know, pace of um, uh, implementation, of uh, rolling out new uh, processes. And I must acknowledge as well that uh, from the regulators, it has also been very positive. The regulators have been very responsive. Um, I lost count of uh, how many uh, regulatory circulars or notes that we received during this time, just to ensure that we adapt very, very quickly uh, and respond to the change. And that was lacking in traditional banks. It has been done, executed very well during this time, and that should not be lost even post uh, COVID. Um, for the challenger banks, I think um, uh, we have noted that the number of clients that were attracted to challenger banks uh, because of the high interest rates that most of the challenger banks were uh, offering just to attract um, you know, deposits. And um, during a time uh, like uh, this one, during a crisis, we see that client behavior is uh, to, uh, you know, to, to migrate to uh, quality. So we have seen that uh, a number of those that were having huge deposits, they're beginning to move the deposits into, you know, what they would assume to be more, uh, you know, secure um, traditional banks and they'll keep their monies in there. Now, that actually speaks a lot. It means that as a challenger banks, we need to think about how do you attract those, you know, cash deposits uh, that you, you know, manage to mobilize uh, even during a crisis to build that trust. It means that the, you know, uh, compliance with, uh, you know, capital requirements, uh, with the uh, regulations, and to give the clients assurance that their monies are safe even in the challenger banks, that would be very uh, critical for challenger banks. Yeah, very interesting. And, you know, with it, at least with our experience um, from the tribal scale side, working both with very much focus on uh, experience and acquisition um, and maybe don't have as much say operational capability um, and regulatory in influence as, as the traditional banks are and you know the regulatory landscape is extremely important so I think it's one thing for challengers to really focus on on, on how to uh, work within regulations and then how to build relationships to push them forward as they bring innovative platforms. Um, Chip Rajit, uh, quick just to you um, you know, what, what do you think that challengers can learn and traditional banks uh, can learn from each other? Um, and we'll try and get that through that quick because we have one more question from uh, Ahmed that we'd like to just get into if we can. Yeah, so um, most importantly, uh, the new banks or newer, uh, the branch legs bank banking approach which are coming uh, taking place and most, uh, most of the banks are going uh, towards that route. From that perspective, uh, adaptability is the uh, priority here. Um, that is the most uh, significant piece which uh, conventional banking uh, should learn. That you know, considering the present scenario, how disruptive uh, my solution is, how we can offer the right kind of platform uh, for the clients to cater and uh, grow my business. And from uh, uh, what probably uh, kind of conventional banking we can learn is the kind of discipline uh, they are following throughout. Uh, in order to manage because uh, we can take off, we can offer some disruptive solution, but uh, at the end of the day, we need to sustain as well, which is very, very important. So uh, it's uh, two different sides of the coin and we need to uh, concentrate on both the sides. Uh, we cannot say that this is right or this is wrong, but at the same time, we need to, the first and foremost thing is to um, uh, have focus on what my clients uh, are wanting. That, that, is, uh, is, that, that is the bottom line of the discussion, I guess. Fantastic. We will um, just have one more question before we conclude here, and perhaps this will tee us up for another webinar, um, as, it, as it's going to be a difficult one to do in a flash here. But uh, we'll start with Alice. Uh, the question comes from Ahmed Alpatin. 
um, how do you see open banking being practiced as it is in Europe, in Saudi Arabia, and in the UAE? So what do you think we can, can glean from open banking uh, and bring over to the Middle East? Yeah, uh, I'm, my personal experience is more based on in Asia and the UAE. Uh, Europe, I just, yeah, just a few experience, maybe can give you the mic. So for the open bank, you need to uh, engage with the local service. For example, take the UAE as an example. Most of the uh, restaurants is the, from the outside. So how we can provide an international money transfer, that's very important. Because the people come here to work, they want to change money back to their country. So how you can provide a quick money transfer without the, with the security and efficiency, I think that is very important. So like uh, open banking, uh, how you to make sure the end-to-end -end transition with the security, that is uh, very important for you. So that's why the Mercer Bank to build the uh, KYC on blockchain. Based on that the foundation, based on that foundation, we can uh, have follow the compliance, we can have to follow the regulations, then to have the most service based on top of the list. So as a uh, open banking, we need to build the uh, infrastructure first. Then based on the on the top to engage with the different service with the local provider. So that is my personal experience, especially in, in Asia and in UAE. Yeah, that's fantastic. And we do look forward to learning more about that experience as um, it's going to be really interesting to learn from someone like yourself in this market as well. Uh, Mike, over to you. Uh, what do you think that uh, the opportunities for open banking will have for Saudi Arabia? Yeah, so, so look, I think it, it, it's become a bit of a white elephant in Europe, unfortunately, partly because of the way it's been implemented. It's been forced down the throats of banks, and they've therefore done the absolute bare minimum to comply with it. At Bank Saudi Francie, and I think I'm, I'm hoping that the same will be true a, a, across the kingdom. We've got a very different view. We, 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 we think it's an exceptional opportunity, and we look at it from three levels. That the, the first one is uh, open banking in terms of providing bankers a service to help fintech get off the ground, and we've started to do that today. And we're working very closely with a number of fintechs as well to bring them onto our bank as a service. Uh, I, I, I genuinely wish banks in the UAE had been able to give me a shot like that when uh, when I was doing kind of you know clearly, but yeah, nobody was. But we're going to change that for Saudi definitely. I think that the the second level is how we expose our kind of um, APIs and allow fintech to then co-develop with us um, and, and share data. And the third one is what we do on a full ecosystem level with the other banks, which we're ready to do. Someone's got to go first, but it's got to be a full quid pro quo. I'm not going to put ourselves out there with nobody else kind of sharing. And I think that's where the regulator kind of needs to come in. But for now, for the good news for fintech, you know, we um, we absolutely uh, expect to sit at the centre of this ecosystem, and uh, and help kind of you know drive the changes that are, that are required. Sure, Rajiv, um, what what opportunities do you see from open banking uh, within within the base? Yeah, so uh, the most important part would be uh, to collaborate uh, with various players uh, and um, uh, in the ecosystem. So gone are those days wherein I have a particular platform and I offer that platform and I, I, I'm, I'm through with my duty. That's not the case. I believe uh, banks are uh, more collaborative these days and we, we need to offer uh, from vendors perspective, we need to collaborate with uh, various fintech uh, platforms and uh, provider, solution providers to offer the right kind of platform. It is not uh, possible for a single vendor to offer everything and anything which uh, probably required from payment space because it's so vast and gigantic. But uh, from other perspective, if we can collaborate with various vendors and if we can see ourselves, uh, gone are those, those days when we I sell a license price and uh, you know I, um, I take a cut and I'm, I'm happy. We need to consider ourselves as partners. We do consider ourselves as partners. 
partners um, of uh, our cli clients and through our collaborative approach with various other partners and third party institutions we try to offer a solution which is a hundred percent a required solution for 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 our clients so that is a pivotal focus from our side Sonny, uh, we'll put it over to you uh, just before we close. Um, you obviously get uh, the benefit of having a large global network from which you can learn from. Um, and, and no doubt it's just a phone call away, uh, either to Asia or to Europe. Um, what are some of the opportunities that you can see with Open Banking in our region? Great. So, I mean, as we all know, uh, Open Banking works on the premise that, um, you know, the information belongs to the clients and uh, the consumer has, you know, the right to choose who uh, he or she wants to share their data um, uh, with. Now, that cannot be successful until there is some form of regulation to ensure that that information is actually uh, secured and uh, protected. Number two, for the banks to open their APIs and allow third parties to be able to access that information, it's also very important for there to be, you know, a regulation that uh, allows that. I, I, if you look at the UK and how it started, with, uh, in, you know, big banks, and uh, there were a lot of le lessons uh, to pick up from there. Um, and uh, when Europe was uh, beginning to do that, I think there are a lot of things uh, that uh, came up. For example, uh, I think Europe picked up that it was important to have a standard API so that you don't have you know, different uh, APIs across the industry, and that takes a very long time to uh, to to have um, uh, implemented. So I think it's very, very important uh, to have, um, you know, uh, regulators to, uh, to engage and to take a lead. There are a lot of um, already discussions and some of the regulators in the Middle East, I think uh, Bahrain probably, are the ones who took uh, the first step uh, much, much earlier, but uh, these discussions are happening everywhere. So in terms of opportunities, I see huge opportunities. If we do it right, a lot of things that are happening today, the paperwork that is you know, continues to move around uh, will go away. And for UAE, probably even better, we have got the UAE pass that uh, uh, you know, is already in play and uh, that makes it um, easier. One KYC, one CDD across the industry becomes much, much easier to go with and cheaper for everybody and convenient for the clients. That's fantastic. Well, um, on that note, um, I'd like to thank everyone who's attended today. Um, it was excellent to see that uh, we had 120 attendees. Uh, appreciate that. I'd also like to thank um, each of the panelists for their time today, uh, for their insights and for their knowledge sharing as well. It was really fantastic. Uh, I've really enjoyed being a part of this and thank you um, for including me. Uh, Ramadan Kareem to everyone um, and best of the season. Uh, Safe, stay home and um, make sure to look forward to uh, the next seamless webinar. No doubt we can tackle some of the questions we didn't get to today around cloud services, uh, with deeper dive into open banking, and uh, we'll look forward to coming together again. So thank you very much, everyone. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, bye. Reza, and th thanks to all panelists for joining. Um, so I hope you, you all enjoyed that. Um, so that is the end of the webinar. The session will be available via our website for on-demand viewing. Um, and if you do have any questions, just feel free to send them across via our website. Um, so we've got our next webinar at 11 a.m. on Monday next week, which will explore fast-tracking fintech innovation during a global lockdown. So thanks again, everyone. Thanks to the audience for listening, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.